Hi all, this is Aditya and welcome back to the Floating School. Today we would be continuing the discussion on forecasting economic growth. In the first session, we discussed a really important question and the question was, how do experts forecast economic growth of a country? Based on what parameters do they assume that a country will grow at a faster or at a slower pace? In the second session, we did a trend analysis of India's ICOR since 1950s. In case if you missed the first two sessions, please visit my website. It's www.thefloatingschool.com. Please watch these two sessions. You'll get a better understanding of this topic. But today I will conclude this topic with the final discussion. And I'll be answering this question, this really important question. And the question is, once India achieves a high economic growth rate, how can we sustain it? Sustainable growth is a challenge. Hence, that makes this question really important. So let us start. So this is my question. Once achieved, how to sustain the high economic growth? Let me give you the answer. Sustained high economic growth requires macroeconomic stability, which has three dimensions. What am I saying? I am saying that India can sustain the high economic growth rate provided it achieves macroeconomic stability, which has three dimensions. So the obvious question is, what are those three dimensions? I will explain those three dimensions, but not right now. I want to start with something simple, yet interesting. So I want to start with something simple and then conclude with macroeconomic stability rather than starting with macroeconomic stability. So keep the word macroeconomic stability on the back of your mind. But right now we'll start with something simple. So this is my question to you. This is a very simple question. What are the three major challenges faced by all the economies in the world? Could you give me the answer? If required, pause the video for 10 seconds and at least come up with one or two challenges. So let us start. The first challenge faced by almost all the countries in the world is to achieve economic growth. Almost all the countries in the world are struggling to achieve economic growth. If they are growing at 2%, they want to grow at 4 If they are growing at 4%, they want to grow at 6%. If they are growing at 6%, they want to grow at 8%. So this is, a, this is really a challenge for almost all the countries in the world. And the problem, if you see the, if you look into the problems, it varies from country to country. The problems faced by the developing countries like India and China are different from the problems faced by the developed countries like US. So, for example, if you look into the challenges faced by the developing countries like India, for us, it is not sufficient for us to just produce more and more goods to grow at a faster rate. We need to, you know, acquire better productive capabilities and we need to acquire sophisticated technologies. Take the example of Turkey. There was a time when Turkey used to export, export olive oil, but today it exports high-end cars and electronics. So we need to evolve just by producing more and more. We can't grow just by producing more and more. We need to acquire sophisticated technologies. Now, what is the second challenge faced by almost all the countries? Once you achieve economic growth, the second challenge is to make sure that the growth is inclusive. I'm saying that the first and foremost challenge is to achieve economic growth. Okay, fine. You achieved economic growth, you are growing at 8%. But the second challenge is to make sure whether that growth is inclusive or not. What Then the question is, what is inclusive growth? The most simple definition of inclusive growth that I've ever come across is this. Inclusive growth is the growth which reduces gaps. And what are those gaps? gaps between rich and poor people, gaps between rich and poor states, gaps between regions within a state and gender gaps. So the first one is very simple. I don't think it needs any explanation. So we'll start with this gaps between rich and poor states. Take the example of India. India has been growing at 6.5 to 7 percent. But are all the states in India growing at a fast, robust rate? Take the example of Gujarat. The per capita income of Gujarat is rupees 1 lakh. 
and the population is 6.4 crore. The population of Jharkhand is almost half, exactly the half, 3.2 crore. Yet, the per capita income is less than 50%. Less than 50%. So, India is growing at a very high growth rate, a robust rate. But are all the states also performing well? So, there are states within India which are not able to cope up. So, this is not an inclusive growth, right? And if you, if you look into states and within the regions within the states even then you'll find that there are certain pockets of underdevelopment within developed states for example take the case of Maharashtra it's a fairly developed state yet if you look into various regions within the state they are struggling to develop so this is not an inclusive growth we don't want this we want all the states and all the regions within the state to grow at a robust rate along with the country so what what is the final the the third issue gender gaps i said gaps between rich and poor gaps between rich and poor states gaps between regions within a state and gender gaps so wh when i am saying gender gaps what do i mean india is growing at a fast you know very fast rate but are we generating enough employment opportunities for transgender community do women get equal rights let us see whether this is true or not see till 2014 women were denied combat roles in the indian army navy and air force they were eligible only for ssc short service commission and the problem is that if you are working for the defense services only for ssc short service commission then once you finish your ssc you are not eligible for any retirement benefits the Retirement benefits are given only to the people who are being employed under permanent commission and women were denied permanent commission. So let us look into the statistics. If you look into the Indian army, the Indian army consists of 97% of men. So the women form only 3% of the Indian army. And if you look into the Indian Navy, the figure stands at 97.2% and the for Air Force, it's 91.5%. So we can clearly see that women are not playing a significant role in the Indian Defense Services and that is not a good thing. Now what are the reasons put forth by Service Chief? The Indian Army has a unique reason. First of all, let me be very clear. I have huge regards for the, for the Indian Army. I, I can really understand their problem. They must be having some real issues. I have huge regards for them but I want you to know the reasons and you decide whether this reason is credible or not. So the Indian Army says that the bulk of junior officers in the Indian Army are from rural India who are not ready to accept women as their leader, especially during a war. And there were one more reason put forth that Indian society is patriarchal, which is not prepared to accept women in combat roles. What, what, what were the reasons put forth by the Indian Air Force? The Air Force said that flying fighter planes is a really difficult, challenging job. So women by nature are not physically capable, especially when they are, you know, during their periods, when they are undergoing pregnancy, it's almost difficult to fi fly fighter, fighter planes because sometimes during a war, you need to fly a fighter plane for 40 hours straight down the line. So this was the reason put forth by the Indian Air Force. E even in Defense Ministry had a reason for this. The Defense Ministry said that in case, suppose if there's a war between India and Pakistan, and Pakistan captures 100 women army officers, Indian army officers. So Defense Ministry says that in such a scenario, the overall morale of the country, the overall morale of the Indian army would get affected. But then something good happened. By the year 2014, we did it. We took a really, really positive step. Indian Air Force, Indian Navy and Indian Army, all of them accepted women in combat roles. The exception is Indian Army. Indian Army has, although it has allowed women in permanent commission, but still it is not yet ready to allow women in direct combat roles. But I think we are moving towards that. We'll reach it very soon. 
I believe this is a really positive step. This is another uh, initiative taken by a, a, a developed state in India. This is G Taxi. This initiative was taken by the government of Kerala. And under G Taxi, the government focused on providing employment opportunities to the transgender people. This is exclusively for the transgender community. Now, as you be know, you must be knowing that transgender communities find it really difficult to look for a job. So this is a really positive step. The objective is to provide a better means for livelihood for the minority group and to ensure them non-discriminatory treatment in the society. Now, let's come back to the question. This was my question. What are the three major challenges faced by all the economies in the world? I said the first challenge was economic growth. The second challenge was inclusiveness, whether the growth is inclusive or not. I defined inclusive growth as the growth which reduces gaps, political gaps, gender gaps, gaps between rich and poor, gaps between rich and poor states, gaps between regions within a state, right? I discussed all of them. And finally, what is the third challenge? Stability of the economy. Once you achieve economic growth, you need to make sure that the growth is inclusive. Once you make sure that the growth is inclusive, you need to make sure that the economy is stable so that you can sustain the growth. So what is stability of the economy? So what is stability? Stability consists of three dimensions. The first is monetary stability. You should have a stable rate of inflation in the country. I'm not saying you should not have inflation. I'm saying based on the nature of the economy you should have a stable rate of inflation what is the second dimension fiscal stability what is fiscal stability stability fiscal stability means balance between a favorable balance between government's income and expenditure subsidies and interest payment and what is the third dimension external stability i'm talking about current account deficit so when can you say that you have achieved stability when you have monetary stability when you have fiscal stability and when you have external stability and when you have all these three things stable you have achieved macroeconomic stability so i hope this has answered this question what was the first question that i asked my question was sustained high economic growth rate requires macroeconomic stability which has three dimensions so what are those three dimensions These are the three dimensions and once you achieve these three, you have achieved macroeconomic stability. With this, we finish this topic and we finish this session. I hope it helped you. In case if you are watching it on YouTube, please visit my website www.thefloatingschool.com. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. And Please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much.